Soteriology 101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the director of apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Hello and welcome back to Soteriology 101. Uh, Not long ago, we produced a rebuttal or a response to the first Calvinist movie trailer that came out uh, being uh, produced by Les Lempier. Um, with the Reform Pub uh, broadcast that, that comes out pretty regularly. Um, and this is kind of a, a sign of the times with an, a young, restless, and reformed generation. Um, and these guys have done a really good job of popularizing and making mainstream something that would normally be considered a very unpopular doctrinal viewpoint, this concept and understanding of, of God having preselected certain number of people to effectually or irresistibly save and passing by the rest in their... Um, their damnation, which they have absolutely no control over the nature in which they are born, and they are born uh, rejected by their maker, and they will live a life hating God because that's the nature that they were born with, and they could not have controlled that desire in any way, shape, or form, and will spend eternity separated from God um, in a place called hell for something they have absolutely no control over. Um, that is a problematic doctrine. That is a difficult doctrine. It's a one that's that's um, it's grown in popularity at one time in history and then waned um, and went away for a long time. And now it's resurging back in popularity, um, especially among what, what is oftentimes called the young, restless, and reformed. And so today I wanted to look just briefly at this um, this this second uh, trailer that's just come out. Um, and you've got to give Calvinist props. They get behind. Um, the people who hold to their doctrinal systematic. And it's always interesting to me that a lot of these same people will uh, criticize me for putting out, uh, you know, uh, for a couple of hours a week, putting out a traditionalist uh, broadcast that simply answers many of these, uh, these, these issues within sociology. And yet you've got places like the CalvinistCorner.com and Monergism.com and a Calvinist movie, which um, this documentary, if you look here at Kickstarter, has over $82,000 raised to... to uh, uh, to support this film, they get behind this sociological um, worldview, and they they identify themselves. I, I matter of fact, I had to delete an account today. It's called like Five Point Supermom or something like that. I mean, how <laughs> many Twitter accounts that are that are somehow identified as Calvinistic or Calvinists? Um, and it's always interesting how um, you know people just kind of latch on to a particular worldview. Um, and they just kind of uh, rally behind that, and they become identified under that that title and that label. And that's kind of what's happened with Calvinists right now. And it's very faddish seeming to me. I, I, I'm not saying that the doctrine in and of itself is completely faddish, but for whatever reason, there's a fad that's kind of been attached to this doctrinal worldview and systematic. And we see this, I think, expressed through um, these kinds of documentary films and that kind of thing. And and, and it's interesting to me as we watch this trailer, notice that really the highlighted point that he first brings up through a quote from R.C. Sproul is not really unique to Calvinism. It's unique to Christianity, but it's not unique to Calvinism. And I'll point out what I'm talking about as we look at this. But notice also he really, really, um, well, you'll see what I mean. Listen (laughs) Listen to this. From the time a child in the United States enters kindergarten, he begins to be taught and to learn, if only through osmosis, a particular understanding of the nature of man, this concept of free will, that man is free to choose the good or evil on either side. That's a blasphemous doctrine. The Bible tells us that something happened radically to the constituent nature of humanity in the fall. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> it's really interesting to me that, you know, when you ha- have conversations, the reason that people get so confused about Calvinism is because you can have conversations with another Calvinist 
and you talk about free will and they'll they'll quickly say well we believe in free will we believe in free will of course they redefine free will to be compatibilistic uh, compatibilistic free will is the belief that man is free as long as they're doing what they desire to do but of course their desire is ultimately dictated by their nature which is controlled ultimately by god within the circumstances which are equally controlled by god and so it is a form even by um compatibilistic scholars own admission it's a form of hard determinism that god is ultimately in control of your nature and the circumstances in which that nature is interacting and that is therefore determined to be what it is in other words you could not choose otherwise you could not choose differently than to reject the gospel you could not choose differently than to rebel against the things of God and to um, to refuse to obey and believe in him. Now, what the distinction is between uh, us and the Calvinists is not really highlighted there because we would all agree that all mankind are born uh, in, a, in a sinful, fallen condition and, and have the curse of the fall and all those kinds of things, and that we, we don't have the freedom to earn or merit our way into heaven through, through good actions. But the difference between Christians— um, and Calvinist, you know, most Christians and Calvinist, or you know, what you might call traditionalist or Arminians or non-Calvinistic scholars in the Christian world, is that we we don't go so far as to say that just because mankind is in bondage to sin, therefore they're incapable of admitting their bondage to sin uh, in light of God's revelation through the law and the gospel. In other words, we we admit with our Calvinists, yeah, we're in bondage to sin be, because of the fall and because of our own sinful uh, hearts and nature. Um, and because of our selfishness, we, we're in bondage to sin. But we don't think that that equals an inability, a moral inability to recognize our bondage and to um, confess that, humble ourselves, and to confess that bondage in light of, of the Holy Spirit wrought truth brought through the law and the gospel. The law is there as a schoolmaster, a tutor, to reveal our need for Christ and insufficient to do so. So in other words, it does what it's supposed to do. The Holy Spirit brings conviction to the world. And we believe the Holy Spirit actually accomplishes what he desires to do, just as the gospel accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. And what's that purpose? To effectually save pre-selected people? I don't believe so. I think John 20, 31 lays it out pretty clearly that these things were written so that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the purpose of the gospel, as 2 Corinthians 5, 20 says, is to make an appeal uh, to all people to be reconciled through faith in Christ, and therefore it's sufficient to allow for and to enable a lost person to respond to that appeal. And um, that's the distinction between us and Calvinists, not this concept of, 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 you know, we've lost our freedom of the will from birth due to the fall of Adam, which is kind of being painted here. Um, in fact, I, I think we can look at another leading Calvinist. We can look at Al Mohler. Um, here's his websites, and he, here's when he's um, he's dealing with determinism here and the issue of determinism from the naturalistic determinist, the atheistic determinist. Um, and, and notice what he says here. He says, the subversion of moral responsibility is one of the most significant developments of recent decades. Though this subversion was originally philosophical, more recent efforts have been based in biology and psychology. I would add theology, by the way. Various theorists have argued that our decisions and actions are determined by genetics, environmental factors, or other forces. Other forces such as God's divine decree, maybe. Now, Scientific American is out with a report on a study linking determinism and moral responsibility. The diverse theories of determinism propose that our choices and decisions are not an exercise of the will, but simply the inevitable outcome of factors outside our control. As Scientific American explains, determinists argue that everything that happens is determined by what happened before. Our actions are inevitable consequence of the events leading up to the action. In other words, free will doesn't exist. So here you've got a Calvinist defending free will when talking to the naturalistic atheist. You've got on the other clip that we just played another leading Calvinist, R.C. Sproul, um, calling the doctrine of free will blasphemous. You can see why people get a little confused when coming to Calvinism. You also see why they always accuse you of misrepresenting Calvinism, because you've got some of them saying the doctrine of free will is blasphemous, while the other one is defending the doctrine of free will. I, he had to hang in there. There's different definitions of different terms from different Calvinists, and they're not a monolithic group, and it does get a little hairy. So you just got to deal with it, okay? So in other words, free will doesn't exist, according to Al Mohler. Uh, Al Mohler's defense here. So Al Mohler's arguing in favor of free will is what he's saying here. So in other words, according to the atheistic determinist, the free will doesn't exist. Used in this sense, free will means the exercise of authentic moral choice and agency. We choose to take one action rather than the other and must then take responsibility for that choice. This link between moral choice and moral responsibility is virtually instinctive to humans. 
Now notice he, <laughs> it's almost like he's saying, like from the very first day you enter kindergarten, this is being taught to you. It's, a, it's like Al Mohler is the, <laughs> the one saying this, okay? So it's just funny to me, okay? As a matter of fact, it's basic to our understanding of what it means to be human. That's Al Mohler saying this now, in contrast to what just you just heard from Dr. Spruill about the kindergartner and this dum 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 kind of music behind it, this horrible blasphemous doctrine. You've got Al Mohler over here going, this is basic understanding of what it means to be human. We hold each other responsible for actions and choices. But if all of our choices are illusory and everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, moral responsibility is exercise and delusion. Now, I don't know how Al Mohler does not see this in relation to his sociological worldviews. I don't know if there's just a cognitive dissonance there. I don't, I don't know. But I cannot imagine how this concept of Calvinism, as taught by five-point Calvinists like R.C. Sproul and Al Mohler, when he's talking about sociology at least, it could not say that everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond one's control. In other words, does the reprobate have any control over the nature of being a God-hater from birth? No, he has no more control over the elect person being born again, does he? Of course not. The, the reprobate born in his condition to be a hater of God has no more control over that than does the elect person being born again and having a new nature that loves and follows God. Not within Calvinism. They have absolutely, it's beyond their control. And what does Al Mohler conclude about that kind of philosophy? More responsibility is an exercise in delusion. That's what he concludes. So keep that quote in mind. If our choices are illusory and everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, moral responsibility is an exercise in delusion. In other words, free will is, um, is absolutely necessary to have true moral responsibility and to understand that we have responsible agency. And what's interesting is that this Scientific American goes on to show through studies that belief in free will and an acknowledgement of free will actually helps people to act as they should. In other words, they do better when they believe in free will versus believing in naturalistic determinism. And Al Mohler actually makes that case. In fact, I want you to hear that for yourself. Let's listen in. Welcome back to the Albert Mohler program. You know, the whole issue of determinism and moral responsibility may sound like something very abstract and esoteric. You may wonder, you know, what does this have to say about my everyday life? Well, let's just think about some things we will all remember, such as, if you're of a certain age, Flip Wilson, the comedian, saying, the devil made me do it. In other words, I'm not responsible for my actions. I'm not responsible for giving in to temptation. I'm not responsible for having made this decision rather than another decision. I have no moral responsibility here. And we, we laughed at it. it. It was funny. It was a part of his laugh line because he had done something naughty, but he, he said, look, the devil made me do it as if that, that's just going to make the moral responsibility go away. Now, that was comedy. It wasn't at all funny, however, when back in the 1980s, a man committed a murder in San Francisco, indeed, of the mayor of San Francisco, and presented a successful defense arguing that he was under the influence of too much sugar and other ingredients from eating Twinkies. Since then, creative attorneys have come up with all kinds of arguments in order to represent their defendants in court, suggesting that even though the act happened, the defendant is not morally responsible for the act. There have been people who have suggested that crimes have been committed because people saw too much television, because they ate too much of this, because they had too little of that. And it's all a matter of determinism. It's a matter of shifting responsibility. Back in the late 18th century, this was basically a philosophical issue, but now it's far more than that. In the mid-20th century, the psychologist B.F. Skinner came up with his theory of behaviorism, arguing that we basically do what we do because we have been conditioned by what we have uh, experienced in the past so that our behaviors are actually more or less programmed by the environment. In other words, we're not really responsible for it. And the whole issue of behaviorism suggested that there are people who aren't responsible for their actions, their likes, their dislikes, their moral choices, or anything else, because given their environment and their experiences, there's no other conclusion or decision to which they could have come. These days, the determinism is a bit more hard line. I want you to think with me for a moment about naturalism. This is the worldview held by those who are committed to evolutionary theory. Naturalism is the worldview that says that everything that is must be explained in purely natural terms which means you can have no room in your explanation for a creator, and you can have no room in your explanation for something that cannot be understood, measured, observed in a natural way. So they're having a big, big problem with self-consciousness, with uh, consciousness itself, with moral responsibility. And this is what they come down to. The brain must be some kind of engine that operates on chemical processes. What goes on in the brain is uh, the intersection and uh, an interreaction of physical matter and some kind of chemical reaction. 
And so there are those who are suggesting that, and they're saying this with a straight face, the brain is not merely the intellectual organ. It's the organ where all these things take place so that our likes and our dislikes, our choices, the choice to do this rather than to do that, the choice to tell the truth or the choice to lie, the choice to go here or the choice to go there, is really nothing more than a matter of the way the chemicals are coming together in the brain. Now, if that's so, here, here's what we know. We know that we're not responsible, and, and it's just true. The human beings want to escape and evade that responsibility. We do not want to have to look in the mirror and know that we are responsible for our own choices. If someone could come along with a therapeutic answer, or a scientific or pseudo-scientific theory to tell us... Or a theological answer. ...that we are not responsible for what we do. An awful lot of people are going to buy into that and say, that's absolutely right. I simply am who I am because I couldn't be anyone else. I did what I did because I couldn't do anything else. Scientific American out right now is reporting on a study in which two psychologists have attempted to link determinism and moral responsibility. Now, this is what they did. They conducted a study in which they told certain people that they that they were absolutely determined that their choices were determined that their likes and dislikes were determined that they had no free will in order to make a decision and thus they were not responsible and then they tested how often they cheated on an exam and they cheated a lot more than those who had not been given the text saying that everything was determined now i'm not sure exactly what to do with this research i find more interesting than the research itself the coverage in scientific american after all scientific american presents itself as something of the public face of research science here in this culture and from the time I was a teenage kid, I was reading Scientific American. But when you look at an article like this, and by the way, I appreciate the fact that this particular article was forwarded to me by a listener to this program, you see that this is now entering the kind of public conversation that we need to have on this program. The link between moral choice and moral responsibility is virtually instinctive to humans. We know that we are responsible for our decisions. As a matter of fact, it's basic to our understanding of what it means to be human. We hold each other responsible for our actions and decisions. But if all of our choices are illusory and everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, moral responsibility is an exercise in delusion. Okay, now I want you to catch that phrase. Notice he says that choices are illusions within this worldview because ultimately you have brain chemicals, the environment, all these things determining something you have absolutely no control of. He even says choices are illusions and every um, and everything ultimately is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control. That's what he says. Listen to, listen to it again. But if all of our choices are illusory, and everything is merely the inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, more responsibility is an exercise in delusion. Do you hear that? Do you hear? All right. And that was, of course, from a previous broadcast, which is why um, well, you hear me talking without me actually, my voice coming through there. Uh, you, that, that's from a previous broadcast, which you can go and listen to the whole thing back uh, you know, several months ago when I, when I for originally produced that. But you can hear, I just wanted you to hear the contrast between what R.C. Sproul calls a blasphemous doctrine, and, and another leading Calvinistic scholar from the Baptist world um, who is ultimately defending free will. Um, and, and some people may think I'm not being fair to uh, represent Calvinist in this. Again, they're not monolithic. They don't all hold to the same view. There is different definitions within compatibilistic free will and um, libertarian free will and all the philosophical debates between those things. I understand all of that. And of course, we've gone over all of those things on our broadcast. But the people who are watching things like Less Than Peers movie aren't going to get into that stuff, guys. What, what's going to happen is exactly what that study shows is going to happen when people are looking for ways in which they can can ultimately give responsibility for their actions over to somebody else. Well, I am what I am because this is the way God made me. Either God gives me a good nature or he doesn't. If God wants me, then he'll make me want him. I've, I've heard atheists say this to me when I'm debating with them and I'm, I'm, I'm using apologetics with them. I've heard them say to me, yeah, well, God's God powerful enough to make me want to believe in him. If he wants me to believe in him, he'll reveal himself to me in such a way that I'll effectually want to believe in him. And if he doesn't, he won't. I've heard them make those arguments because they've had enough conversations with Calvinists to actually believe that that's what the Bible teaches, that you're not really responsible to humble yourselves and admit your own sin, but that God's one that's responsible for changing your desires to make you want to do those things. What's that going to do to the next generation of people who are not careful to go through these different philosophical issues and arguments and understandings, and they're just watching your popular, you know, young wrestlers reform guys like Leslie and Pierre putting out videos that say free will is blasphemous? That, that you tell me. A reformed resurgence has always been the young, restless and reformed. And it was all I could do not. Yeah, and we probably should always listen to young white people. Because you know, young white people always get it right. I'm not trying to be facetious and mean, but that's that's this resurgence. It's young white preacher boys for the most part. Now I'm not. I, I, you may say, well, I know I know some women who are reformed. I know some African Americans and Hispanics that are reformed. I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm saying generally speaking, there's a huge, huge number 
of young white males in this resurgence right now, especially within Southern Baptists. And even uh, even John Piper did a broadcast on this when they were asked the question. He was asked the question, why is this doctrine not very popular among African-Americans? In other words, why is Calvinism not not growing among African-Americans? Well, maybe because it was the Calvinists that promoted slavery back in the day. I, it, maybe that was the reason. Maybe that that um, that it was the Presbyterians and the Calvinistic Baptists that were more tended to be more uh, pro-slavery, and that maybe generationally why a lot of African Americans have rejected um, the co- concepts of Calvinism. I know Calvinists aren't going to like. I'm not trying to say Calvinists today are racist in any way, shape, or form. They're not. Um, but I'm trying to say that there may be actual reasons besides God's decree for why women and n- minorities rejected and have rejected this particular philosophical way of thinking over the years. And you got to think beyond just this concept of what young, especially young mainstream white kids are thinking right now and think maybe this is just a fad that's going to pass like it did the, the last two or three times that it's r- kind of rose up in history. Just scream out, Jesus wants the rose! Do they call you a pastor here or dude? And that's the way it was in the Reformation. The thing that makes Calvinism... Is this (laughs) pro-Calvinist? I'm watching this and I'm going, that (laughs) kind of makes me turned off to Calvinism. I'm just saying. (laughs) Calvinism is the view of scripture that emerged out of the Reformation. Why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? And the answer from Paul is, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? Okay, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Is that Paul answering an Arminian scholar or traditionalist scholar who's objecting to Calvinism? Well, the Calvinist would lead you to think, yeah, that's what it is. But I suggest that you pick up a book (laughs) called The Potter's Promise, um, and it's very cheap if you want to get it on Kindle, um, pretty cheap if you even want to get a hardcover copy of it, and it's pretty easy to understand that the objector in Romans 9 is the same objector we see in Romans 3, which is the Jew who has become hardened and calloused in his rebellion. He wasn't born that way. He became hardened and calloused over time. That's what callousing is. It's growing and growing more and more calloused to the words of God. As Hebrews 3 warns, when you hear his voice, don't allow your heart to grow hardened or calloused. You're not born with a callous heart. Yeah, you're born under the curse of sin, but you're not born with a callous heart. There's a difference between those two things. Calvinists think you're just born with a callous heart already, and therefore you can't see, hear, turn, and understand. But the Bible never says that. The Bible actually says these people's heart has become calloused, speaking of Israel. Therefore, um, because of this. Otherwise, they might have seen, heard, understand, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I take the gospel to the Gentiles, uh, Acts 28, 27, and 28. And therefore, this is a growing process that we can all become calloused and hardened. We're not born in that condition like the Calvinists just insist with their doctrine of total inability. And so the calloused Jew, who were thought to be the chosen elect people, of special people of God, or the children of Abraham, they thought they were owed salvation. And they're finding out that God has given them over to their blinded and calloused heart. He's sending them a spirit of stupor. He's speaking to them in parables, lest they see, hear, turn, and understand, and repent. That he's using them in their callous rebellion to graft in the barbarian Gentiles and to accomplish the redemption of Jesus on Calvary. That he's actually using them in the rebellion, cutting them off in their unbelief, not cutting them off for no apparent reason before time began because he doesn't really love them or doesn't really want them. He's held out his hands to them all day long, as Romans 10, 21 says. He's longed to gather them like a mother hen gathers her chick, chicks, as Matthew 23, 37 says. He, he weeps over them, as uh, Luke uh, 19, 41 and 42 says, that he, he sees that this has been hidden from their eyes because of their calloused condition, because they think they're physicians. They're the old wine skin that won't accept the new wine. And they have grown calloused and hardened to it. And that calloused, hardened Jew who realizes he's being cut off in his unbelief and being used in his rebellion to accomplish God's purpose for redemption is saying, why would you blame me if you're using me and my rebellion to bring about your glory and your purpose and your plan? That's the objector in Romans 9, 10 and 11. Because the same objector who's hardened in Romans 9, the same objector who stumbled in Romans 9 has not stumbled beyond recovery according to Romans 11, 11. The same objector who's hardened in Romans 9 is the same one that Paul holds out hope that might be provoked to envy through the ministry that he has to the Gentiles so that he would be grafted back in. 
can't be the reprobate of the Calvinistic worldview because how do you graft somebody back in who's been hardened and cut off eternally for no conditional reason? Doesn't It does not follow and it does not flow. Calvinism is a house of cards that will crumble and fall once again when people begin to put out more information to combat this kind of resurging doctrinal movies and these kinds of things. When, when we, as non-Calvinists, can raise $80,000 for a, a, a faddish Young Russell's Reform movie, then we'll begin to see the, the pendulum swing back the other direction with the next generation of young people that go, wait a second, this just doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem like God, the God of, of Jesus. This doesn't seem like the Jesus who, who sacrifices himself for the sake of humanity versus sacrificing humanity for the sake of his own glory. It, this, this doesn't look right. And, I, and I, mark my words, my prediction is this, that the next generation of Christians will rise up against this kind of teaching and this kind of doctrine when they begin to compare it with what true, sound, exegetical, and hermeneutical theology teaches them when they go beyond the Joel Olstein kind of quote-unquote non-Calvinism And they go into more of the A.W. Tozer kind of non-Calvinism, and they get a deep, robust theological answer to the issues of election and predestination and foreknowledge and all of the issues that end up leading people into Calvinism in the first place. If you and my critique was also apparently predestined for eternity, God found pleasure in Leighton Flowers critiquing and combating uh, Calvinists. Deal with that, Calvinists. Good luck believe that God's love for you was set upon you, not for anything in you or that you've done. It sets you free to serve Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's nothing you can earn. It's a weight off for people. By by the way, uh, for those who are listening to the audio, watch the video. Um, but let's listen to the audio. It was an a, a image of John Calvin's picture pulling the, the nail out of the frame of Jacobus Arminius's picture where it fell. Listen, not many Calvinists today have even read John Calvin's Institutes, and even fewer have read Jacobus Arminius. I remember back in probably 2001 when I first started coming out of Calvinism myself, I went to read Jacobus Arminius. He sounds, he sounds like most modern-day Calvinists today big on the sovereignty of God and the glory of God and God being sovereign in control of all things, all this. Go read, if you don't believe me, go read Jacobus Arminius. He sounds so much like what many Calvinists really want to hear. Um, and it's really interesting when you, when you read Arminius for yourself, um, how many things that he says and how he says them um, that really highlight, it's not this namby-pamby, you know, easy believism kind of stuff that a lot of people try to paint Arminian as, you know, like he's, uh, God's looking through the quarters of time to foresee who's going to do the right thing and choose. Arminius doesn't sound like that. You, you need to go, in other words, get out of your echo chamber of your Calvinistic worldview and read some scholars for once. Um, and, and stop just, uh, you know, just listening and regurgitating the same pat answers that you're used to. And, and I really challenge Cal- Calvinists to, to go beyond the pat answers of the, the five-point systematic. I can't even see the kingdom of God, Jesus told Nicodemus. I have to be born again. And of course, we're born again through the truth of God's word, as Scripture says. In 1 Peter 1, 22, it says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living, enduring word of God. So how are you born again? You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living, enduring Word of God. So when there's uh, commas there, you can actually take this little section out and just skip right over um, and and see what it's through, that you're born again. I've been born again through the living, enduring Word of God. And so it's through the Word of God that one is born again. You're not born again um, absent from the Word of God. Now, even Calvinists would uh, try to say, well, this is a simultaneous, that you're born again 
uh, through the preaching of God's word and all these other things, the kinds of arguments that they would make. But as we already read from from John twenty thirty one, these things have been written so that you may believe. That it's through revelation, it's through the light of God's truth that we believe. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The word of God comes to grant or to enable someone to believe and to repent. That's why he says, I grant repentance to the Gentiles. What is he saying? Well, I granted it first to the Jew by bringing them the gospel of repentance. Then I bring that message to the Gentiles, granting that to them. Now, Calvinists will use the term grant as if it means to effectually cause. You'll hear it all the time. They'll say, well, God has to grant you faith. God has to grant you repentance. And we look at them and go, yeah, so granting means to enable. It doesn't mean to effectually cause. Um, I can grant my son the ability to take my car by giving him the keys. It doesn't make him do it. He still has to go out and get in the car and drive it. I've granted it to him. I've enabled him to do this. Um, granting, enabling, drawing, all those words that Calvinists oftentimes reinterpret to mean to effectually or irresistibly cause to happen um, are simply just not supported in the pages of Scripture. And that's unfortunate that they continue to try to get away with that. Um, they just redefine terms and redefine words in ways that fit their doctrinal systematic. All right, there it is. So you can own it. You can buy it. It's uh, You can see who it's featuring here, R.C. Sproul, Paul Washer, um, James White, Joe Thorne, Tim, you, you can see them all, Steve Lawson, some of the big names in Calvinism. Um, that And it's coming out in October, I believe, it said. Um, it's got a few seconds here. Let's see what it goes on. It's Calvinist movie, calvinistmovie.com. You can see more there. Um, and so that's their second trailer that they have. Uh, that's coming out. This is his website, uh, Calvinist Film by Les Lempier. Um And this is the kind of fad, popular movie stuff that you're going to see coming out, um, calling free will, the doctrine of free will, blasphemous, um, despite um, what uh, other Calvinists teach about uh, you know, free will and what it means. And unless you think I'm misrepresenting, this link, uh, which I've gone over before in other broadcast, was sent to me by Phil Johnson of Grace to You Ministries when we were having a Twitter exchange back and forth on um, the concept of free will, um, the concept of compatibilism and what it is. And uh, look at it for yourself. Fair by starting here at the top. Um, this is from monergism.com. Again, sent to me by Phil Johnson, president of Grace to You Ministries with um, John MacArthur. It says, responsibility and voluntary choice are not the same thing as free will. We affirm that man is indeed responsible for the choices he makes, yet we deny that the Bible teaches that man has a free will since it is nowhere taught in the pages of Scripture. So here you have a Calvinist uh, denying free will. Again, Al Mohler earlier defending it, so that's why there's some confusion here. But he's talking about compatibilism here, so listen in. Um, he says, it's nowhere taught in the pages of Scripture. The Bible teaches rather that God ordains all things that come to pass, Ephesians 1.11. And it also teaches that man is culpable for his choices, uh, cites some verses there. Since the Scripture is our ultimate authority and highest presupposition, the multitude of clear scriptural declarations on this matter outweigh all unaided human logic. We find that almost always the objections to God's meticulous providence over all things are moral and philosophical rather than exegetical. I would disagree with that. Most of my arguments have been exegetical commentary on the verses like Romans 9 that we talked about earlier that are propped up and used out of their context instead of addressing Israel's hardening and their judicial hardening in their rebellion as being the objector, uh, assuming that the objector is objecting to the Calvinistic worldview that God has uh, pre-selected to effectually save a certain subset of, of individuals and pass by others who are born in the decreed condition um, of this moral inability to respond to God at all in any way, shape, or form, that if we object to that claim of Calvinism, object to total inability and irresistible grace and un unconditional election of individuals before time began, then somehow we're objecting to God himself. Um, this means that, he goes on to say, this means that we must strive to consciously affirm what the Scripture declares over our finite understanding and sinful inner drive for independence. What about the um, the inner drive uh, to uh, denounce our responsibility that uh, Al Mohler mentioned when talking about the atheistic determinist who would like to find a, some kind of philosophical reason to give our responsibility, our moral responsibility, over to some natural um, determinism. Maybe it's a theological thing that people in their sinful drive to get rid of their human responsibility, if I can just say, well, God made me this way. I, I can say, well, I was tempted to sin because ultimately God decreed that I be tempted to sin in such a way that I could not have resisted that temptation. Um, 
that uh, by my addictions are ultimately decreed by God from eternity past in, in order to give me a thorn in the flesh like um, like one Calvinist argued. Um, so, yeah, there, there's ways in which we could turn that argument right back onto the Calvinist to say maybe it's the Calvinist and his sinful desire to try to get rid of his own responsibility that's causing people to become determinists, the, theistic determinists in that way. He goes on to write, he says, in order to understand this better, theologians have come up with the term compatibilism to describe the concurrence of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Compatibilism is a form of determinism. Do I have to say that again? Compatibilism is a form of determinism, and it should be noted that this position is no less deterministic than hard determinism. Okay, this, again, sent to me by Phil Johnson from Grace to You Ministries, which is a leading scholarly Calvinist. I've had others like Matt Slick, who I've sent this link to, say, well, that just sounds like good Calvinism to me. So he's affirmed this as well. Um, how do you get around that? When, when you say that we're accusing you of being hard determinist, this is from your, one of your scholars, your compatibilistic scholars, saying compatibilism is a form of determinism. And it should be noted that this position is no less deterministic than hard determinism. It simply means that God's predetermination and his meticulous providence is compatible with voluntary choice. Okay? In other words... What they're saying is our choices, he goes on to say, our choices are not coerced. In other words, he's not putting a gun to your head and coercing you to make choices. We do not choose against what we want or we desire. We never make choices contrary to God's sovereign decree. What God determines will always come to pass. Um, this is why I oftentimes compare compatibilism to the, the, the potion or a drug, that if I were to slip a drug in your coffee right now, um, all the Calvinists listen to this. Let's say I had the ability to... to uh, to put a potion upon you, to put a spell on you with my incantation words, and I changed your nature to where you became a traditionalist. Would any of you, if you found out that I used a potion, put it in your coffee this morning to make you believe what I teach, would any of you call that free? Well, of course you wouldn't. Well, you did it freely, didn't you? You did it voluntarily. You did what you desire. Now, I changed your nature to make you desire it, but you still did what you desire, so that must be defined as freedom now, according to the Calvinist. Of course, they would not define that as freedom. If I put a potion in their coffee to change their very desires and their very nature to make them where they wanted to become a traditionalist, not a single one of them would call that free if they found out what I did. They wouldn't. The only way that they would might consider that free is if they kept it a secret and didn't find out that I slipped a potion in their coffee to make their desires and their nature change. Uh, it just simply falls apart. It's just a form of hard determinism. That's all it is. In light of Scripture, according to compatibilism, human choices are exercised voluntarily, but the desires and circumstances that bring about these choices occur through divine determinism. Okay, so did you hear that? Uh, do, do I need to read that again? Because, I, matter of fact, I'm just going to highlight it here so you see this. Okay, in light of Scripture, according to compatibilism, human choices are exercised voluntarily. In other words, people are doing what they want to do, but what they want to do within those circumstances are brought about by divine determinism. You get it? So the second cause, you're, you're the first cause of your choice because you're desiring to sin. So you desire to lie, and therefore you lie. But the reason you desire to lie is because your nature ultimately produced that greatest subset, that the greatest desire within those given circumstances, and you could not have done otherwise. And that was a result of divine determinism. In other words, God decided that you would decide to lie at that moment in time. God decided soteriologically that you would reject God and you would reject the gospel because he decided ultimately what your nature was and the given circumstances of your life. And therefore, everything is ultimately determined. And therefore, you've got exactly what Al Mohler talked about earlier. If our choices are illusory and everything is merely an inevitable consequence of something beyond our control, moral responsibility is an exercise in delusion. That is what Les Lampier is promoting through a quote of R.C. Sproul saying that free will is blasphemous. And you wonder why I'm doing this broadcast. It's time for traditionalists to wake the heck up, people. How is this going to affect the future generations? You tell me. The studies from this Scientific American that Al Mohler is quoting from tells us what happens to people who start thinking that they are destined to be something beyond their control. And yet that's exactly what the theological system of Calvinism is teaching, is that ultimately it is God's decreed determinism, his determination 
of what you will be and what you will become, it is not up to you. It is not your choice in the matter. And that is a dangerous doctrine to hold to. And unless we begin to put out some robust materials to combat these kinds of things, it's going to continue to grow, people. It is. Unless we begin to answer the questions as well as and with the cool stuff that the Calvinists are putting out there with all their T-shirts and mugs and all their faddish stuff, as much as we want to laugh at all the goofiness of that stuff, it works. It works to put out videos and to put out all of this stuff to make Calvinism attractive. They've done a really, really good job of it while we're sitting on our thumbs waiting for somebody else to do something about it. When are we going to start working towards making the doctrines that we hold to and that we think are valuable known to people. Let people know what we believe and why we believe it. You could be kind, and I'm not mean to people when I'm doing this. I can respect and love these people while telling them, hey, man, you're wrong. <laughs> I love you, but you're wrong, okay? That's my free will. I have a free will. They, you do too. You, the reason that they're making a mistake in, in our worldview is because they have the free will to make those mistakes. Now, of course, if they're right, then I'm, I've been destined by God to be wrong. And that doesn't make a lot of sense either. But either way, hopefully this has been helpful. Spread the word. Share with others. If you want to join us, come to Sociology 101. Sign on to be a patron. We'd love to have you um, come and be a part of making the, the provision of God's love and grace known to all people because God truly does love and provide grace to all people. Thanks. See you next time. Bye-bye.